Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our instruction course on a neophyte gonioscopist, an animative guide and videographic toolbox. Now we all know that gonioscopy is, an, uh, is a critical examination in glaucoma workup. Lack of routine gonioscopy often culminates in misdiagnosis and maltreatment. None of the uh, advanced imaging techniques were able to replace gonioscopy fully. So here we have our uh, uh, panel of uh, glaucoma specialists who is talking to you about the very basics of gonioscopy. We have Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh Ramesh from Mahatma Eye Hospital Trichy for visualizing normal angles. Unfortunately, Dr. Prasanna could not be with us because of an injury. So instead of Prasanna, his uh, fellow Dr. Ramanan will be speaking on that. Uh, and Dr. Manoj Pratapan, uh, Associate Professor at Amrita Hospital, Kochi, will be speaking on understanding angles in gonioscopy. Myself will be talking about documentation and special situations. And Dr. Bindu S. Ajit, who is a glaucoma consultant at Comptrust Eye Hospital, Calicut, will be speaking on direct gonioscopy. Now I invite Dr. Ramanan to speak on uh, visualizing normal angles. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, all these efforts are uh, Dr. Prasanna's efforts and energy. I'm just sharing it here. So let's go on to the topic proper. It's visualizing a normal angle. This is actually a vital aspect for uh, any uh, ophthalmologist and a budding resident. You'll be learning so much from this uh, seven minute talk, so a 10 minute talk. So we'll be, uh, we'll start with differentiating a normal iris processes from a pathological peripheral anterior sinecae. So every image, uh, every animation what you're seeing here is uh, designed from Mahatma uh, Center of Moving Images. Uh, we have our uh, Chief of Design, uh, Dr. Mr. Uh, Tensing is there. He will be demonstrating you the 4D analog also. So here we will be seeing the normal angle anatomy. It starts from the ciliary body and it extends up to the Schwalbe's line. You all will be oriented towards it. So I'm just giving you an animated exam example of what is happening inside the eye along with the clinical video to demonstrate what is there as an angle structure. To, be, to become an ophthalmologist, the basic training should be more focused towards how to see the angle. It's a most complicated process and then how to see the fundus. For that, you will be, if at all you are getting exposed to such a scenario, you will be very good for our learning and we will be demonstrating the animated template and then the clinical video along with it so that uh, people who are uh, analyzing this can easily see the angle structures and appreciate it which is actually a little confusing at the beginning of your residency. So now uh, the grading of angle structures is e uh, nicely demonstrated here and this is the grade 3 to 4 which is completely open and grade 2 and grade 1 angle structures which you can easily appreciate it after the animated video. So uh, we, we will, whatever is there is a live image which is acquired from our center, all our patients like whatever is there and we are documented it for uh, learning purpose. So we'll, let's start with the basic. So we will be ex explaining the patient what we are going to do and we will place the, uh, make the patient sit upright and we'll position them in the slit lamp and we'll, we have to position the lens uh, starting with the lower fornix, all these simple things we have to focus. So let's go to the uh, next step, which is uh, indirect gonioscopic examination by a Goldman lens. So this one, uh, you, you have to see the slit also. Uh, in the bottom of the image, you can see the slit lamp. You will be, it will be moving to the vertical slit so that you can see the angle structures nicely. Now it will, it will, the zoomed image will come. You can see the angle structures very clearly. If at all you have use, try to use the slit lamp in a proper way, which this video is demonstrating you. So let's see what all the difficulties we'll be facing. That uh, this is the iris process and which we uh, already seen in the animated video. And this is the peripheral anterior sinecae. You can, I'll again playing it. This is the peripheral anterior sinecae, which is coming. This is a pathological peripheral anterior sinecae. This is going to rise the IOP. It is going to block the angle structures. So uh, we will be seeing the animated image in a clinical video in this. So this in the right side, you'll be seeing the iris process as a real time image and in towards your left you will be visualizing the peripheral anterior sinecae. I think everyone here can appreciate the peripheral anterior sinecae. So let's go on to the uh, animated image which you can see the iris process at the top and then uh, the peripheral anterior sinecae in the half of the image. So let's go to the angle viewing order. So we will be having a Goldman 3 mirror, 1 mirror and Goldman 2 mirror. So towards your right 
there will be three rotation needed for goldman three mirror and one mirror first you will be seeing the first uh, inferiorly and then towards your temporal aspect and superior and you can see the nasal aspect depends on the turning you can visualize the angle structures and for the gold mirror you just need only one rotation you can simultaneously visualize two angles so we will be describing you what is happening there so let's go on to the manipulative gonioscopy this is a very nice video like the patient is positioned straight we are seeing the the patient is asked to look straight now you can see there is a, a positional closure when the patient is looking down you can see visualize the angle structures which is opening so i'll again play this video please look into it so we have kept the lens and the patient is looking straight the angle structures will be seen now and it's, it's closed and let the if the patient is looking down inferiorly the angle structure is getting open you can see the click there that's how you have to see whether it is a positional or it's synechial angle closure you have to differentiate that that's a part of a glaucoma management and indirect gonioscopic examination we will be using the z's method and this is you can do with the cross and the plus so this you need not you don't need to rotate the lens it will be giving you the perfect angle structures and indentation gonioscopy this compression gonioscopy is very important in therapeutic situation so what we will be doing in a special situation we will be demonstrating it so uh, this that if at all we see a uh, blood in the angle structure we should definitely look pre pre operatively we have to look for the mapping of where it, the bleeding is coming so uh, at that situation you have to avoid the serious bleeding you have to do the ang see the angle structure and uh, if at all you find uh, a high femur uh, if bleed is there you have to look it opposite directly opposite you will be finding where the bleed is happening so the video is demonstrating where is the bleed and the source of the bleed can be identified so gonioscopy plays a clinical role very vital clinical role to identify where you want to look and what you want to do in certain situations this is one such scenario so whenever you do a combined surgery and you see the bleb always we will be all will be looking at the bleb but the most important part if at all you feel there is a iop rise is that blocked ostium which is which we can't see it in a normal slit lamp we have to use the uh, gonioscopy and see whether the ostium is patent or not the right side of the image is showing a patent ostium and the left side it is demonstrating a blocked ostium again i'm re-insisting it all these images are taken in our clinical setup mahatma Eye hospital and all the animations are done in with the mahatma clinic of uh, moving images so the post-operative ostium evaluation can be done in very important manner and we have to analyze all those in other uh, special scenarios post pkp status and expression we, we have to analyze the angle structures to know what is going to happen so th this is a pseudo exfoliation patient and we will be seeing a sample is line in this video so uh, whenever there is a trauma we should always be careful to look for this angle recession and uh, patient will land up in uh, serious issues so for that the gonioscopy plays a very vital part and here we can see the broad ciliary band and there is a gap which demonstrate the angle recession in this video so one more aspect of this image is a beautiful image like demonstrating a stump of iris along with that you can see the ciliary processes this is aniridia aniridia is just a stump of iris is there and you can see the ciliary processes clearly which will be beautifully seen in the gonioscopy and uh, whenever you have a, a difficult scenario this will uh, reveal so many aspects that uh, our uh, chief of animation mr tensing is actually our patient so he's a 24 year old male and uh, he came to our op with the uh, raised in iop all those scenarios but he ha he had a icl implanted what happened is like wherever he went people always uh, spoke about the issue with the icl but nobody believed that there is something is uh, issue with this angle everybody was always looking at the icl and they told like the icl is might be not implanted in a proper way but what happened is actually when we look into the gonio he had a pigmentary glaucoma which is due to the iris rubbing uh, the icl and it's causing the blockage and we diagnosed him and he went for a trabeculectomy now he is doing very well he is there with us and he'll be demonstrating you uh, about the animations and 4d holograms at the end of this slide end of this uh, session so these all the animations which is there for learning and we have an app to demonstrate all these scenarios so what all mechanisms are there and what is happening whenever uh, the blockage is there it's, it's, it will be demonstrated in the uh, 
in, a, in the video and this animation is showing that what is happening whenever you keep a ICL and what, 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 how the pigmentary glaucoma is forming, all the blockage due to the pigment is in the trabecular meshwork is happening is demonstrated here. You can see this clearly. So, uh, when you look into the uh, training part of a gonioscopy, the application of gonioscopy is always there when in the intraoperative and the lasers which you are going to give. This is, uh, we can demonstrate it in the selective laser, trabeculoplasty, organ laser and ALP, organ laser, peripheral iridoplasty. So, I am going to demonstrate to you what is happening again the normal animated video which is very clearly demonstrating it and how what is the spot size of the organ laser trabeculoplasty and how we will be giving the selective laser trabeculoplasty in such scenarios. So this one animation which is going to give you a detailed outlook to demonstrate to anyone whoever wants to know even the patient education also we can uh, really give them a proper analysis of what is happening inside the eye. This is an eye with a normal angle and I will quickly skip to the next part. And the eye with the oppositional angle closure, you can see that what is happening there with the red arrow. And then the argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, it is opening the oppositional angles. Whenever you give a laser, it will pull the peripheral anterior sinus and it will open up the angle so that the angle structures will become free, which can be easily seen in, the, in such kind of uh, animations. So, again, to, know, uh, to see what is happening to the peripheral entry sinus with the application of laser, I am just demonstrating this animated concept. See, nicely, whenever the laser is applied, the PAS is shrinking, which is giving the way for aqueous to drain. So, in summary, there is always a correlation to look at the AC depth and anterior chamber angle width, which can be done with the uh, von Erichs grading and again with our gonioscopy grading. So, we all need to be understanding what is happening inside the eye and then we have to demonstrate. The deep chamber is always, most of the time it will be having a wide angle and the shallow chamber will be having a narrow angle. What it implies is that whenever we see a hypermetropic eye, we have to be very careful about the angles and we have to see what is happening in their angle structures also. This is very simple diagrammatic explanation. If you see that there is a deep chamber, there is a very large opening and then if you see the shallow chamber, there is always the closed uh, angle structure because the lens is swollen and it is causing the aqueous to uh, drain in a pro not a proper way. Here we can see the lens is uh, enlarging and the iris structure is closing because of, th of this. The cause, the effect is happening in the aqueous drainage. The aqueous is not draining properly, the IOP will rise. So this is a post-angle closure attack eye. Again, we believe in give, giving a metaphorical aspect of what is happening in a clinical scenario. So whenever you see such scenarios and if the lens is causing, go for the extraction of lens and always removing the lens will give the relieves the pupillary block, it rotates the iris posteriorly, changes the zonal or vectors and ciliary body position by moving it posteriorly and it always acts as a, increases the trabecular meshwork flow and it releases the peripheral anterior sinecae along with the, the increase in the anterior chamber space which is going to give a way for more aqueous drainage. So what, what happens to the iris when you remove the lens is like nicely demonstrated in this animation and the iris is Pulling back again, I am showing it. Whenever the lens is removed, the iris is coming back to its original position and it is giving a way for aqueous to drain. So this is the fate of scleral spur which is again demonstrated with the animated video and uh, peripheral anterior sinecae is there. And I thank this opportunity uh, for uh, uh, Prasanna sir, I unfortunately he has not been there and uh, we, we are trying to do more things in the in Mahatma center in, uh, along with the Mahatma moving images forum and we are uh, already publishing what is happening with the minimal invasive glaucoma surgery and uh, what is the economic perspective in India Journal of Ophthalmology and what we are doing in uh, uh, in our center we are uh, already publishing it in the YouTube. Please do follow the channel and you can see so many interesting videos there and uh, we believe in cognitive video based training and that makes me to travel here instead uh, of sir even he is not there uh, in the last minute I am here and I am demonstrating what he made. So that cognitive video based learning is the future and it is definitely going to, uh, up, up, in an upcoming manner it is going to revolutionize the education of residents and even the MBBS graduates. And we have a, 
4D model which is there waiting for you. You can enjoy the hologram, it is there. We have a virtual reality headset which is going to give you the real time image of AI and its structure. And uh, really thank you for this opportunity and we are looking forward for you all to use the technology. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramnan and Dr. Prasanna for this wonderful presentation, good videos and photos. Now I invite Dr. Manoj Pratavan, sir, for his talk. Good afternoon, everyone. And also let me thank Dr. Sweta for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking on understanding the angles in glaucoma. So why is this important to understand the angle? The mechanism of glaucoma uh, can be varied and uh, this can affect the course of the disease. Some of the type of glaucomas present as a crescent uh, type like primary open angle glaucoma. Some of them will have a very aggressive uh, course like neovascular glaucoma or an acute angle closure crisis. And the treatment is also appropriately directed. Uh, we don't go into the details because Dr. Uh, <clears throat> uh, earlier already mentioned about the normal angle structures here. Just a video about uh, how a normal pigmented angle looks like. You can see the iris, uh, the root of the iris, ciliary body, scleral spur, pigmented trabecular meshwork, anterior trabecular meshwork, and the pigmented schwal baseline. Let us classify the disease into open and closed angles. Occlodal angles, we'll come to it later. So what is open angles? How do you know if the angle is open? On a slit lamp examination, on straight disc conoscopy, if you see normal iris configuration with visible aqueous access to posterior trabecular meshwork, we can call the angle as open. So what are the types of open angle glaucomas? We have primary, where there is no other ocular causes for leading to glaucoma. And secondary, again, we have three, three, three types, pre-trabecular, trabecular, and post-trabecular. This is an example of pre-trabecular glaucoma, neovascular glaucoma. You can see neurobiosis iridis and neovascularization of the angle. This is a trabecular type of glaucoma. There is marked increase in the pigmentation of the angles. This is uh, again another type of uh, trabecular mechanism, angle recession glaucoma. Post trabecular, raised ESVP, dilated epistolar veins, and blood in Schlem's canal. Next, coming to closed angle glaucoma, we have, again have primary and secondary. Primaries have pupillary block as a component, whereas secondaries can be with pupillary block and without pupillary block. Without pupillary block can be pull mechanism and push mechanism glaucomas. Now, let us figure this out with iris configuration. So what is the normal iris configuration? There is a mild convexity anteriorly. This is because of relative pupillary resistance, which everyone of us have. This causes a pressure differential between the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber. The posterior chamber pressure is slightly more than the anterior chamber. This causes the iris to be slightly convex anteriorly. When this is exaggerated, we have pupillary block and a exaggerated convexity of the iris, causing shallowing of the peripheral AC. The central AC is formed. This is a sign of pupillary block glaucomas. This is a clinical photograph of a secondary pupillary block glaucoma. Another example. Next is steep iris configuration. So in this, there is no pupillary block. The entire iris is pushed forward. Classical examples are aqueous misdirection syndrome or um, corridor effusion. So here, the central as well as the peripheral AC is uniformly shallow. This is an example of aqueous misdirection syndrome, post trabeculectomy. You can see the angles opening up after so mitriatics are used. Now the angles are open. For these push mechanism glaucomas, you can see the ciliary process through the pupil when you do a gonioscopy. Next is standard up in the periphery. These are in pull mechanism glaucomas. The central AC is formed and in the periphery, the iris is pulled up. These are seen in uveitic glaucomas and neovascular glaucomas. Other examples are also there. So here, here you can see multiple focal passes in the angle. There is no pupillary block here. The other iris configurations that we can have are flat iris configuration and concave iris configuration. 
when do we call it narrow or closed angles <clears throat> on straight gaze gonioscopy if you see negative visible aqueous access to the posterior trabecular meshwork we can call it narrow or closed so the possibilities are either it is occludable angles or closed angles so what do we do when the straight gaze gonioscopy is not showing angle structures then we should do a manipulative gonioscopy where we try to see over the hill so if you are able to see the angle structures that means it is an occludable angle if you are not able to see it could either mean there is an aerotrabicular contact or a synecal closure if it is negative then to differentiate between itc and synecal you can do an indentation gonioscopy if the angle structures become visible it is an aerotrabicular contact if it is not visible that is a synecal closure this is just a representation you can see the convex iris configuration suggestive of pupillary block angles are not seen once you do indentation the anterior chamber pressure is raised and the iris is pushed backwards on the right side you see the angles opening up on the left side it is not opening up because of synecal this is click a picture of indentation from gonioscopy you can see there is no angle structure visible after indentation the angles are open next coming to a plateau iris configuration this incidence is about 32% in patients with post pi this is because of an anteriorly inserted ciliary body the anterior chamber depth is fairly normal there is an element of pupillary block in most of these cases and yak pa is warranted if angle remains not visible in spite of patent pa think about plateau iris configuration if the iop is high in this situations we call it plateau iris syndrome this is the classical double hump sign that is seen in plateau iris configuration look at that video is not playing sorry so you can see in this uh, photograph that is anteriorly placed ciliary process and the iris has to climb on top of that so when you give indentation gonioscopy the middle part of the iris concaves backwards and the two convexities are because of the lens convexity and the ciliary body convexity let us grade the angles we are using shaffer's grading if the angle is wide open if the angle width is more than 25 degrees if we can see the scleroless pore ciliary body we can call it 3 or 4 and the possibility of closure is impossible if the angle is about 20 degrees and only up to trabecular meshwork is visible it is still narrow and the probability of closure is possible it is extremely narrow if angle width is 10 mil 10 degrees and we are able to see only up the shawl base line or atm in this cases the probability of closure is eventually possible a complete or partial closure closure is when there is aerotropic aerot peripheral ac contact angle width is zero the corneal wedge is not identified and probability of closure is present or imminent thank you thank you dr manoj sir for the wonderful presentation So now after seeing the normal angles I'll be talking something about the diagrammatic rendering video capturing special situations and challenging situations so doing a gonioscopy uh, in your routine glaucoma workup is really important but equally important is documenting it because next time when you see the patient you won't be remember remembering what exactly you have seen so that is the importance of diagrammatic rendering and also it is also useful for patient education as well as for training your post graduates or your fellows because we know how much difficulty we had when our post graduate period doing a gonioscopy it was really difficult uh, so now I, i do not have any financial interest now coming to the diagrammatic rendering uh, when you talk about diagrammatic rendering you have to know about the becker's goniogram which he becker described in 1972 here you what you see the dark line that is a scleral spur three outer lines are the schwalbe's line and the trabecular meshwork three inner lines are the various level of iris insertion into the um, ciliary body so if you have a k sheet you can attach such a becker goniogram and whatever you see you can mark it it's all color coded so you can mark the angle recession blood pigments any pas so you have to mark it now uh, when you talk about the documentation of course you have to know the grading system shaffer system already dr manoj sir has covered it 
I'll talk a little bit about the SPATE system. I'm not going into detail. Uh, so SPATE gives a very detailed uh, recording of level of iris insertion, angular width, iris contour, TM pigmentation, and effect of indentation. So talking about the level of iris insertion, wherever the iris is inserted into the angle, that is the level which uh, they have described. So you have A, anterior to Schwalbe's line, B, behind the Schwalbe's line, C, scleral spur, D is deep and extremely deep. So this gives us an idea how uh, the iris insertion is. Second, the angular width, it ju just describes, it is similar to the Schaffer's grading. You have to just gr uh, tell the degree of angle. Now, iris contour is also important. Normally, the normal contour is represented as F, that is flat. C is a concave one which you can get in an angle closure. B is a bored one which you can get in a pigment dispersion syndrome. And P is a plateau iris which uh, already sir has showed you. And according to the trabecular meshwork pigmentation, you have various grading from 0, trace, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So one small example, the first uh, one, it is marked as A in brackets, C, 15, B, 3 plus. What it means is that when you're seeing the angle, it is A, that is uh, iris is inserted, anterior to the Schwalbe's line. But once you do the indentation gonioscopy, you can see the scleral spur. So that is the meaning of that. And then 15 is a 15 degree angle. B is a bored iris uh, contour and 3 plus is trabecular meshwork pigmentation. Similarly, the below one you have D45 F2 plus which means that it is uh, the iris is inserted deep into the ciliary body. 45 degree angle, F is a flat iris contour and you have the 2 plus pigmentation. Uh, so making it simple, you, j you can just use two cross lines and uh, record whatever posterior most structure that you see. That is one of the things which we usually do. And then uh, mark the clock cover of the peripheral anterior sinecae where, where you have seen. And any other abnormalities like pigmentation, iris process, any other abnormalities. So, but now we have all gone paperless. Now the everything is shifting to the EMR. So having this uh, goniogram is little difficult. So the next era is of video capturing and photos, which we have already seen many photos. So for video capturing, uh, this is to document your findings, convenient for patient education and easy integration into network. So the question comes which uh, mirror you can use for the video capturing. So you have the Goldman 3 and 1 mirror, which is a non-indentation type, Zeiss and Posner mirror, which are the indentation types. But when you're taking a photo or video, it's always better to have the uh, non-indentation one, which you use the coupling gel. It will have more stability, so the videos will have uh, good clarity. And if you have trabeculectomy, uh, trabeculoplasty lens, like SLT and MLT lens, if you have, these gives little more clarity. So uh, the images which I'm going to show are all taken in the BQ900 uh, slit lamp, Hag Street slit lamp in imaging module IM900. These were taken when I was doing fellowship with Dr. Satyan sir at Coimbatore. So uh, this gives very good uh, imaging and always pay attention to the image on the screen rather than looking through your eyepiece. Now, but uh, it's not always practical to have uh, this lit lamp and imaging modules which are all really expensive. So one of the example is this telescopic mobile holder, which actually Dr. John Davis Akra, who is from Chaitanya Hospital and West End Hospital, he has taken lots of beautiful images using his uh, mobile camera and this telescopic mo mobile holder, which is available in the Amazon with uh, less than 500 rupees. It can be attached to the Hag Street model or the Zeiss model slit lamp, and you can take beautiful photos of gonioscope, I mean angles. So, uh, and he has also demonstrated how to use it. Another example, if you have attended the smartphone uh, imaging uh, previous session, smartphone gonioscopy, which, is, which uh, was um, put forward by the uh, Dr. Prithvi Chandragant and team, here they are, not, they are taking the images without the help of slit lamp. Uh, along the uh, mobile camera, behind the mobile camera, they are uh, um, using 10 diopters of uh, intraocular lens and then uh, keeping the gonioscope on patient either supine or sitting position and you can take the image even without the uh, slit lamp. Then you have direct imaging of gonio mirror by smartphone by Dr. Nilesh Kumar. Uh, so nowadays everything is coming up, uh, all these smartphone technologies. Now I'll be showing some examples of some of the clinical interpretations. Uh, some of the videos may be um, 
uh, repeated, but still the more you see, the more you know. So you have um, uh, pigments, uh, uh, this kind of pigments in angle is uh, generally seen in pseudo exfoliation syndrome. The patchy pigments which you get is seen in the pseudo exfoliation. And if you have dark pigments, um, which is uniform throughout the angle, these are seen in pigment dispersion syndrome. So if you have a pigment dispersion syndrome with a per, um, bored iris, you can actually do a peripheral, YAG peripheral iodotomy and it can, uh, it, in some cases it helps in reducing the pigment dispersion. Now this is another example of uh, an angle uh, recession. There is an evidence of trauma and you can see that the ciliary body band, it's wide and the iris is actually recessed from that. So that is an angle recession. Any patient coming to you with a shuttlecock injury or any blunt trauma to the eye, uh, after the initial phase of inflammation settles, any bleeding, it has to settle and then do a gonioscopy, you have to rule out an angle recession. Angle recession is really common in the shuttlecock injuries. So, and also it is imp equally important to compare both eyes. You see both eyes, there will be a difference. The other eye will be completely normal and this will have a wide uh, angle. So this is an example of traumatic angle recession. Uh, traumatic angle recession glaucoma, it can come any number of years after the trauma. Sometimes a patient may not be even remembering that they had an injury. It might be five years back, but they can have a raised IOP after five years. So it can come any time. And this is one of the example of the uh, double hum pattern. On indentation, you get this um, um, hump pattern, which is seen in the um, plateau iris. So another example of, I mean, this is an example of uh, peripheral anterior sinecure here, which is uh, more anteriorly into the cornea. And uh, you can see fine processes here in both the angles. These are iris processes. Iris processes are normal uh, findings which we see in angle. You should not mistaken it for the peripheral anterior sinecure. PAS will be a little more broader and this will be very thin and lazy and uh, it won't block the angle structures. And here you can see the blood in Schlem's canal. And uh, this was a video of a patient who came to us with uh, for cataract evaluation. And on examination, the cornea had stellate KPs in her endothelium. And on doing gonioscopy, you can see that the angle had fine vessels, which on doing gonioscopy actually started bleeding. So this is a case of uh, Fuchs uveitis. The patient's IUP was normal. You can see the active blood that is coming here. So in fuchs, you will have very thin vessels in the angles, which will bleed on gonioscopy, or it can also bleed on table when you're doing the cataract surgery. Once the IOP comes down, you will have bleed from the angle. So uh, another uh, uh, example of um, this uh, gonioscopy of seeing the uh, trabeclectomy ostium. So you have a bleb and you see that IOP is raised. You have to definitely see how the ostium is. So uh, here we have a patient who has an iris blocking the trabeclectomy ostium. So gl glaucoma examination is never complete without a gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is a must not only for glaucoma, even other uh, conditions also. Here you have the fine new vessels that are seen in the angle. So these new vessels will cross the scleral spur. Uh, so this is an example of uh, ciliary processes that you see in the angle, I mean, while doing the gonioscopy. This can be seen because this is an NVG patient and the uh, pupil is mid-dilated. Now coming to, uh, this patient had PDR and he came with a raised IOP on uh, examination slit lamp, didn't show any NVI. But on seeing the gonioscopy, there was bleed in the angle. So it's not always uh, that you will get an NVI in the pupillary margin. You always have to see the angle to rule out NVG. And another patient, this patient actually went to two or three doctors complaining of uh, uh, irritation and uh, watering. And he had this corneal decompensation which was there inferiorly. But now everyone gave uh, uh, drops, but only when we did a gonioscopy, we could see a foreign body that is sitting in the angle. This was a cause of his uh, corneal decompensation in that particular area. So we did a, um, we removed this foreign body and he, he was a little bit better, not completely all right, because it was a long term. He d do not give any history of any uh, injury. So. Uh, and some of the challenging situations, I think I'll take two more minutes. 
So uh, always you have a doubt when you see a pigmented Schwalbe's line, whether this is a Schwalbe's line or a trabecular meshwork. So what do you do in uh, such cases? You have to do the corneal wedge technique. Corneal wedge technique is nothing but you have to keep a small slit and keep it at an angle of 60 degree. You can see two lines which is coming from the anterior and the posterior surface of the cornea. This meet together at the Schwalbe's line. So this is an example of uh, corneal wedge technique. You can see the anterior uh, one and the posterior one join together at that line. Uh, that is the corneal wedge which is corresponding to the Schwalbe's line. So uh, never confuse a pigmented Schwalbe's line with a trabecular meshwork and always examine the inferior angle first which will be seen very clearly and only then go to the next angles. Then uh, if you put excessive uh, pressure on the gonioscope, you can have corneal folds. So it's always important to keep the optimum pressure. And manipulative gonioscopy already Dr. Ramnan has shown you. And uh, in case of edematous cornea, you can use anhydrous glycerol drops to see the uh, angles. Now, special thanks to my mentor, Dr. P. Satyan sir, uh, and uh, acknowledgement is Dr. P. Satyan sir and Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Sweta, for this opportunity. Now we go to a different indication for gonioscopy. So I think these slides are already talked about. So the principle behind gonioscopy, as we all know, is the because of the total internal reflection, you are not able to visualize the angle. So now we are talking about the direct gonio lens. The convex surface which is kept over the cornea bypasses or eliminates this total internal reflection. The difference here is there's no mirror in this lens. So you see the angle, you visualize the angle, the same angle which you are seeing, it is not reversed or inverted. So initially it was uh, proposed or the direct corneal lens was used for pediatric glaucoma where under anesthesia the angles were observed and if necessary cornea was clear, goniotomy procedure was done. But now why we are talking so much of direct gonioscopy? Because of the advent of the Gonio surgeries and more of cataract surgeons becoming glaucoma surgeon. So you have to learn the art of doing direct gonioscopy. So that is the advent of mix with a lot of stents coming up. So you are driven to do gonio directed surgeries. So the direct gonio lenses, the initial one which was available was a Schwann Jacob lens and now we have many more coming up. I'll just deal with it during the videos. You have the glaucoma eye prism, which is the latest one, and the COSA hands-free gonial lens, and the Katina lenses. So all these patients we are going to do direct gonioscopy is basically because we want to do surgery in them. So what are the prerequisites? The main important thing is the patient selection because we need to change the neck position of the patient. So the patient should have a neck mobility, and it should be a cooperative patient and a no head tremor. And you should be able to see the angle before you pose for the surgery. Now, it is not only the patient's preparation. You also have to prepare yourself. Know the landmarks, like what the previous speakers told. You have to know the landmarks. And then practice, intraoperative practice. Before you go and do a surgery, you practice the procedure of doing the intraoperative gonioscopy. And then you have to know something about the lenses also. So anesthesia, yes, it can be done at a topical, but involuntary eye movements can lead to some complications. So when you're a novice surgeon, it's better to block, builds the surgical con confidence and then avoids the potential complications. So now how do you prepare yourself? It is not only you, you have to prepare the microscope also. It requires a tilt. You should need a microscope where you can tilt the, the video is not playing, yes. You can tilt the head in. So you have a arrow mark in the microscope. It shows how much degree it is tilted. So you can tilt it around 35 to 40 degree. And then you move the patient's head away from you, around 35 to 40 degree. And then ask the patient to look away from you. These are the pre-preparations you do before you go and do the gonioscopy. And because you want to avoid unnecessary neck movement, you can lift the knob under the IP so that you can comfortably sit and do the gonioscopy. 
So now you know how much to tilt, you mark it and keep so that repeatedly you needn't keep on tilting to various levels. So you can have a marked one so that you can use when you have a gonio procedure, you can tilt it to the prefix marks. And the position when you're sitting also is different. In a FECO, you're sitting close and your hands are close to the body. But here you have a, you need to space for you to hand, you move to hands and you need some space for the movement. So you uh, place yourself a little away from the operating table. So you get more space to move. So which gunia lens to select? Initially only this was available, so we are doing with this. It gives you a 1.2 magnification and it can be autoclavable. Now we have glucose prism. It has an expanded field of view. It is a unique concave geometry, allows precise coupling and it has an anti-reflective technology also. And the hands-free lenses, and these are the other lenses. Then once you are get ready with the patient and the microscope and the lens, now you know you have to dock the lens. So this you know, cornea is highly innervated, so it can be painful. So either you put anesthesia, put anesthesia drops, or you put a gel, or you can use the viscoelastic, cohesive viscoelastic, coat the cornea, and then you place the lens. So this is the docking video. And then you visualize the angle. So here, it is not just visualizing. You need to have an end phase view because your light, like in cataract, it is directed directly downwards. But here, you need the uh, light to travel in a coaxial panel parallel to the laser, of the, parallel to the iris plane, so that you get a visualization and you not, do not damage other tissues like the cornea or the iris while doing the procedure. So that is the end point. And once you see the angle, then you increase the magnification and increase the illumination too, so that you get a clear view. So identifying the trabecular meshwork, like in a direct gonioscopy, you can get clues by the pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork. And sometimes heme is present. Especially after phaco surgery, when you do a gonioscopy, you can see blood in Schlem's canal, which helps you in identifying the landmarks. So the literature says that you can stain the trabecular meshwork with trypan blue. So after FACO, you put bilocarpin drops which can constrict and then dock the gonio lens. And once you get the view, magnify and have an image. Now you can identify all the structures and then you can start your procedure. This is a bend needle goniotomy being done. So now every cataract surgeon can become a glaucoma surgeon too. But beware, it is only in the early glaucoma cases. So this is the view with the glaucose eye prism. Here you get a more wider view. So take some practice to stabilize both your hands and the coordination. And this is the Katina lens. Here you get a more wider view in all, better than the Schwann Jacob actually. So the end face view is important. If you're not getting it, you can tilt the head more and then you can focus the angle. So now you're ready for the procedure when you have a proper view of the angle. So what are the problems we can we, uh, we get to see when we are doing? Uh, similarly, with the direct gone uh, indirect gonioscopy, the corneal folds can also obscure your view. And how do you overcome it? 
when the IOP is too low or the visco is flown out by pressure on the section, again then also your positioning might have just by the movement of the eye, the position of the lens might have moved. Check, the pre check and reposition it. And always we need to take time to focus. So when you're focusing initially, you don't focus with the foot pedal, but with your hands, you move the microscope because the finer movement you can do with your foot pedal. That is once you do it with the foot pedal, then you have a very minimal range of movement and you might find it difficult when you're doing the procedure. So the other problems when you, um, that you encounter is a minimal air bubble under the lens or air bubble in the viscoat which have used can obscure your visualization of the angle. Or especially when you are planning for a surgery with the gonio procedure, you, a phaco surgeon should select an incision which is more into the clear cornea so that the blood doesn't come in the view. A mere blood under the lens can obscure the view so that you are not able to see that. So the blood is coming under the lens and you are not able to see what is the angles underneath. So like I told before, if you are not seeing or if the NFS view is not being done, uh, viewed properly, you can have problem in judging the angle anatomy and difficulty in the doing the procedure too. The solution is rotate the head further away, rotate the scope towards you and tell the patient to look away. If it's still blurry, it might be too zoomed out or the conjunctiva might be ballooned out or if it's a corneal edema is present or if your accommodation is at fault, again you might get a blurry. So first, once you have mastered the gonioscopy, then you can just try with a 26 gauge needle, bend tip and then go do your bang procedure. You can start with that and then go and this is a video which I have already shown you. And then you can move on to the KDB, which is similar to the 26 gauge needle. It is just the uh, more pricey, I'll tell you. <laughs> but then you can do the same procedure. You do one side and then turn it and do the other side also. So until your hand moves, you can cover the angles. Just have two more slides, I think. And then turn it and then. You do the same procedure. The other gonio procedures are the trabectome and the abinternal canal plasty. And the future of glaucoma surgery is the gonio surgeries. So you have to learn to do a intraoperative gonioscopy also. Now the newer ones are the hands-free gonio lenses where it's like a retinal biome. You, you can just fix it under the microscope and your hands are free. So thank you. I think all FACO surgeons can learn and become a glaucoma surgeon. Too. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, madam, for that wonderful talk. I think we have uh, 10 minutes. Any questions from the audience? Ma'am, how do you choose your patients for MAGS? Uh, basically, open angles and then cooperative patient and at least one or two medications, not more than that. So and medically controlled on two medications? Uh, even I've uh, tried it with medically just 22, 23 on a single medication. If they are going for cataract surgery, you can couple with that. And if it is not controlled, you can continue the medications. It's always coupled with cataract surgery or do it as do it as No, well? I have done it only with cataract surgery. Is the commonest mix that you do? Now it is KDB. KDB. <laughs> I stand? No, I haven't started no. it. And 
uh, how do you deal with the uh, bleeding that you have during the yeah, surgeries? The problem now I face is after phaco surgery, usually the patients are very happy. But if you combine with this, the next day it is bleeding is there and you have to uh, prepare your patient also. Tell them that it's not going to be that clear vision. Because now I, you might have done just phaco and they have the ne immediate next day you get a very clear vision. But this hyphema takes some time, not in all patients, but yes, they do have. But during procedure, you can, if you find bleeding, you can inject visco into that area. I just leave some visco there. Is it done in a block? I have uh, tried under block, but I find topical is much better because under block, when you have to tell the patient to move that side, the doll side movement comes and the... Does this I hurt or is it okay with the uh, intracamera? It doesn't hurt. Only thing is the patient movement comes in way, especially with the KDB, it's a little bit more sharper. So in one patient, I had caught an iris. The sudden movement, it uh, traumatizes. There's no pain as such. There's no additional pain. Any other questions? Any postgraduates here? No questions? See, the most common question which we encounter during presentation of gonioscopy is which gonio lens to buy. So, I would like to say that when you are a beginner, always go with a gonio lens which has a coupling solution, either Goldman 3 mirror or a single mirror lens. And then, because that only gives you stability while doing the uh, gonioscopy. And do gonioscopy not only for a narrow angle, do it for all the patients in the beginning. So you take lots of myopic patients and then do the gonioscopy. You, can, you get to see all four structures very clearly. So once you do it on 10 patients, you will get to know what exactly it looks like. And then you will never miss any, uh, you won't have any doubt. So once you master the uh, gonioscopy with the couplings one, uh, then it's better to go with the non-coupling. Uh, not only the indentation, you get a Goldman two mirror lens without the coupling gel. Because when you have a busy OPD setup, it's not always practical to uh, use a visco, then clean it off. Patients will feel better when you're not using a gonioscopy without any visco. So that, is, uh, that will make it more uh, uh, smoother. Any other tips you have to give, ma'am, on gonioscope? 